John C. Gibson, Tony Live from the Marriott Hotel in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. I attended the Dream Big Project, brought to you by Tanisha Warner. She did a wonderful job. She had Russell Simmons here. He dropped a lot of incredible knowledge. She had a lot of successful black entrepreneurs like Kathy Hughes. It's been a time. Now we're going to turn these dreams into visions and use this knowledge to manifest it. Until next time. idea of operating from a stillness because whatever I, I did that was good came because of a, a presence and I, and I talk about that I can't stress that enough because there'll be many speakers and they're gonna say lots of stuff that a lot of stuff is all of what they say is valid but in the core there's always operating from a calm mind and there's always this happiness thing that attracts everything so if you can work on yourself then you can be a good giver that's the most important thing is to operate, whether it's you refer to God that's inside you or your resilience, your strength, your brilliance, all that is in here. None of it's on the outside. So practices that bring you in here are what we're going to talk a lot about because I think that's what I can offer. And that's what I know is written in every scripture over and over again and taught by every prophet. So I want to stress that because it's usually overlooked. So how do you access this still place? Well, it, in everything, you know, the focus, single point of focus is critical. And, and we all have the ability to do it, but, you know, it, it happens sometimes, usually naturally. So passion is, is, is important. When you read a book and you can't even breathe, because not can't, but you don't need to, because you're so focused. You know, it happens all the time. You know, you have these experiences where you're completely in, in when you make a good record and the melody is playing, and that melody is, you know, it's so beautiful that everything else disappears, you can't possibly be thinking about the result. You know, you may have a short thought, wait till my friends hear this, right? And then you may have another thought. If you haven't thought about the money, you definitely can't get no, can't make a good record. So we want people to be able to, be able to delve inside and be engaged in their process, to make their work their prayer. And that's what I think is, is, is key because that's where every creative second comes and that's where every productive second comes from is that presence. So you're saying for these entrepreneurs as they're working in their gift and they're working in their skill set do not necessarily be so attached to the result but be in that moment? You know they tell you there's a quarterly report coming that's why CEOs and entrepreneurs are sometimes very different people different parts of the brain operating, you know, there's the short-term result and there's the long-term health of your project, your process. And you want to do something that you feel comfortable is, is going to promote a lasting, stable result, not a short-term, you know, one to, to fit the analyst or to meet the, the quarterly thing. And, and so it's, it really is first to come up with something that fills the hole. So it really is first the entrepreneur's spirit and his belief in giving something that he believes in. Right, and, I want, and entrepreneurs, most of you, I guess, have ideas. There are people, by the way, I'm not dis discounting it. There are people who are numbers of people. Like, you know, I met the guy who built Coffee Bean, and we were doing a partnership. He never had a sip of coffee before he built Coffee Bean. He had a thing for numbers. 
He loved, you know, he understood the franchise business. He understood, so he had a thing for the operation side of it. And there are those people. But even those people have long-term, you know, kind of, it's a creative process still for them. It's not, you know, one that adheres to public scrutiny or, or, or people, you know, infringing on their vision. It's one for them, you know, to, to go about their vision from a creative, and even its numbers from a creative standpoint. Gotcha. All right. Um, Nick, you have often said that you worked for years before seeing a real profit for many of your businesses. Everything. What is your advice for these entrepreneurs who may be in that very place today? It's, you know, it's resilience and faith. The number one thing that you have to have as an entrepreneur is faith. I never, I mean, I'm sure people have worldly success as a, you know, in short term, you know, ventures. They just go in and be successful. I never had that luck. You know, everything I've ever done has taken much longer. And my partners have always, I always shed my partners because they always quit. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, I, now I own 100% of something that I, I used to own 50% of, and they just quit. You know, like now, and it happened in every business. You know, and you know, producers. I remember. I can think of everything. The music, no one believed in it at all. So obviously, whoever was in, got invested in the record and didn't, whatever, but I worked the record. And then we had Christmas rapping on the shelf and then Rapper's Delight came out. Damn, I should have stayed in. <laughs> Gave me my money back a month. Anyway, so, <laughs> so I did, and, and every success story I had after was the same. Mm. I had producers on Run's house. Didn't nobody want to do a Reverend and 5 A students? I had partners on Fat Farm and they owned half the store and when, when and I went through three, two bankruptcies for licensees, I went through constant failures and losses at the store. I had partners, I shared them all. Well, I, at one point I owned 20% of Fat Farm early on, then I owned 50, then I owned 70, then I owned 100. Mm. I stayed on the hustle and they quit. Wow. Um, I've had a lot of partners in alcohol culture now finally have the number one manufacturer of suits in the entire, 80% of the suits, great part, makes all Ralph suits. This man is breaking his neck down, getting ready to ship all Macy's stores. And I had so many partners, and they're all going to look up and say, damn. Mm. And, um, <laughs> and, I, and every experience, you know, and there's movies I'm making now that people were part of and not anymore. And there's, you know, there's always, um, and my experiences have always been, it takes a little longer, a rush card, damn, you know, six years before I made a nickel. No one ever heard of what we were doing. Stop thinking I put my name on that shit. I invented that issue. I'm not, 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 I'm not very humble or, you know, sweet, but we did that shit with no such thing as a, 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 a prepaid uh, a business. We invented it. We lost lots of money researching and figuring out how we could do it. What was a virtual bank for people who couldn't get a bank. There was no bank for these people. And then now, you know, five years ago, after five years of losing money, we start making money. And then, you know, lots of people joined in, you know, Chase Manhattan and Walmart and American Express and all these people, you know, and I still believe we're the best. You know, and we're 595 because we picked the phone up when you call. And we got card to card transfer and we have, um, which 99 cents, not $35, you know, we have lots of resources, budgeting tools, we're going to retail now, but you know our pricing has gone down, and we've got 23,000 free ATMs, which is, we're announcing this week. So there's new stuff all the time. But when we did that industry, there was no such thing as that. This was a, a, and, and the, an entrepreneur looks an entrepreneur looks for a white space. He looks for something that people need that's not there, and he creates something that he thinks is special and fills a hole. You know, and this is for underserved communities. And then one day we looked up and they, they said uh, that it cost $350 a year to manage a checking account. Well, that means they got to get over $350 a year to manage the people whose checking accounts we're talking about. And so there's 150 million Americans who the banks don't want. And they charge more at the end of the day uh, than our services. So we're trying to create new, you know, it's different between Tower Records, which has a building and employees and stuff, and iTunes, which is a little different, right? So it's that we think we're more like iTunes, and in some cases the banks are more like Tower Records. Yeah. <coughs> but there's always innovation. I, this came from innovation convention, and you know the, the wallet, the money wallet, the phone's going to be your wallet, and all these things. Is, we're always ahead of or studying the innovation. 
to see which ones we can integrate that people will actually use. The prescription discount health care card that we have is a tremendous hit because people are saving 80% on some of their drugs are between 20 and 80, usually around 50% of the cost of their drugs. And that goes along with the rush card. So we create, we're creating what we think is a financial well-being company. Gotcha. And but that has to do with filling a hole. I think that's what the question was about. Gotcha. Now, I think it's absolutely amazing when you, that you were able to stick with the dream in the midst of failure. So I know entrepreneurs in here, how many of you have experienced failure? Well, you can't fail till you quit. All right. And that's what so, I want to talk about. Yeah. That's important. You know, so, I mean, everything I did was a failure. I don't have nothing but failure. <laughs> my, if, if you call, if you label it such, and then you walk away from it, it really is that. But if you have it as a learning experience, and your great, your greatest teacher comes from suffering. You can't learn except that you have experienced, you know, you know, something that taught you, and and you have to accept those those teaching learning experiences for what they are. And this is the practice, you know, like in yoga, the physical practice. We smile and breathe in difficult poses. Right, and take that off the mat, and then you know it, they tell you no. That ain't no twisting triangle, is it? I mean, it's, you, it's not that bad. It's to keep pushing, and I think that's that's what you know. That's what happens when people who quit, you know, can be failures. But if you can't quit, you can never fail. So stay on your hustle a lot. You know, it takes that one more, one more day, and then you find a little result and learn something. And you know, don't live for results. You know, in, in scripture it says you have control over work alone, but never the fruit. And then it goes on and on to talk about this idea that the work is prayer and just enjoy that process and, and the learning experience that it is and, and, and get your happiness from your work because the toys will never pay you. The results don't pay. The work itself is what pays. So that's an important point, I think. Um, here. You talked about a number of the businesses, Fat Fashion, Rush Card. Um, I know that you sold a piece of, of Rush Card, but with Fat Fashion, you uh, well, know Rush. Yeah. Yeah. And you actually sold uh, Fat Fashion to Kelwood. How did you know the right moment to sell? Well, we thought we would get a lot more, but we're still getting great results and great board members. We sold to the people who are the lead investors in Facebook, Axel Management. Um, a piece of Rush Card, a small piece, and we sold a small piece to Carlisle Group because they're such big banking investors. Um, they advised us not to be a bank because of all the regulations and issues that would come on and other people who have taken our business into the banking business have found it to be a burden. Even if I would have wanted to learn to loan money or to create other vehicles, lots of vehicles. We give people their money three days early, two or three days early. Some of you have a rush card, your money is in your bank on Wednesday. Uh, sometimes Tuesday, your money is on your card. That, if I was a bank, I couldn't do that. So there's certain things that we do that a bank would have made prohibitive. So call out who helped us, helped us with that. And Axel has helped us with some tech stuff. But the reason we sell is because we want to grow. I sold Def Jam because I wanted uh, a better infrastructure, better distribution. And to some, some degree that worked out that the artists benefited. Um, I try to sell it to places that make us better. I thought a bigger, better infrastructure would make fat form better. But it was good timing. I mean, young men's companies can only last until young men get to be old. You know, when you see you know, run sitting around a TV show, or TV, watching TV on his show, looking like, a, you know, <laughs> with a big fat form thing across his chest. <laughs> and he come Diggy. You know, Diggy don't want to wear that shit. <laughs> So we got out in time on that. <laughs> it's true. I mean, like you know, you know. So young men. So that's why we did Argyle as an urban graduate. There's a big hole in the market. That, you know, and, uh, there's not one main, one black designer. Macy's given me a big break. No, you know, you think Calvin and Ralph and Tommy and Lacoste. You think that? Oh, remember those all? It was Fat Bob and Rockaway and Sean and John and Nietzsche and Eka and LRG and Shady and all these, all these cult Echo. I mean, there's so many. And, and then they grew up and they all got to buy Ralph. That's not right. So, and, 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 
and so, but you know, we ain't gonna fight about it. We grow up, and the urban graduates are like, yeah, just give me that shit, I'll put it on. Like, but, you know, as younger people, we fought and made it happen, but, you know, but we have to create something culturally. You know, I can wear Ralph, but his pants are baggy. He used to be the opposite, right? His pants are big. Just a cut, you know, they're not cut like, you know, the way we try to. And I'm, I say we, I'm 90, right? So, you know, but, you know, they're not cut the way we want it, and, you know. J. Crew's a little better, you know, but the way Ralph is so that, what you see in department stores is, is cut differently. It's not as colorful and fun, because even if we want an argyle or a golf sweater or a cardigan, we've got a little more color, you know, and a little more flavor. And, and I think that's, that's where the urban graduate lies. And, and he's not black only, he was the urban, you know, this urban audience was, that bought hip hop and it was culturally at one point was 80% non black. So a great percentage of them are. And I think that's a, another message to tell to entrepreneurs, you know, you ain't no black entrepreneur shit, unless you sell hair care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's, you know, legitimate, but you know, everything else you sell is for everybody. That's right. And I think that's important. That's another, if we don't get to talk about integration. I'm in Hollywood now, I moved there, I take my, I want to meditate every morning with my kid take him to school. And I've been doing that every day. Um, but then I come down the hill, I gotta serve, right? So my new service is I'm making a bunch of movies and TV shows. I mean, aside from, moving, it took me a year to move a lot of my stuff there to be close to those kids every day, but so there's so much you know, people don't know how to integrate you know, and you have people in Hollywood say, well shit, if you send me one I would hire them, you know, they, what does that mean? They say, you gotta be up in their face and you gotta take care of their kids you can't expect people, to, I mean there's, there's so much reaching out they're gonna do there's money in integration there's money in it it's cultural, though, as well as it is economic. It's, you know, it's, you, know you have to learn to love everybody. Shit, you can't say, I, I wave at them at work. Fuck that thing. And I think that that's an important lesson, you know. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I had a, a partner in television and film. There are many partners in television. One of them lived in Rodeo Drive, his best friend. And I understand that my generation, and especially a little bit older than me, it's like his only other friend was, you know, another black guy in Hollywood who did Hollywood shit too. They were black people in Hollywood, you know. And I still see that segregation so strong in media. And you know what? This is a liberal, progressive group of people. I'm writing a letter to the president now. Every single guy in Hollywood signed a letter that had to do with black people being incarcerated. They all want to fight for it. And but they're not going. And, but if you live in Beverly Hills, also you have this thing. You know, you watch Jerry Springer. And you know that they're integrated, but in Beverly Hills, you're not. Right. No matter how much you like to see a post-racial America, it's not really going on in right. Beverly Hills. Yeah, right, right. So they don't realize the world is changing. I was in Chicago yesterday in advertising. I see it. The research has proved that they like to see post-racial content. And in the movie, and in TV, I mean, in records for sure, you see it. It's integrated. But the Academy Award, you see segregation. It's not... By the, it, it's, it's by geographic. They just don't know the world is changing. You gotta put them up on what's, what's going on. You have to do it, you, the work. You know, I think that's part of the process. And I think, um, and that's what you have to do. You, you're not black entrepreneurs, you're entrepreneurs. And you have to take on the partners that suit you. And you have to, you know, be conscious. I'd say turn your back on the suffering, run five charities, but be where you gotta be. You know. That's important. Gotcha. Um, the next question goes, uh, it ties to your last book, Super Rich. Um, what's the one piece of advice would you give to this audience around becoming super rich? Well, I got a, a half a star from Business Week for this book. That's what they gave me wow. in the book. <laughs> <laughs> but Deepak Chopra got the other half. We both put out business books. <laughs> It goes back to the difference between an entrepreneur and a um, uh, entrepreneur and a, um, and, a, and, a, and a CEO. CEO has to adhere to certain things, and the numbers are all that matter. And maybe the numbers sing to them. An entrepreneur is a creative person, but in order to be a, a good entrepreneur, you, you have to be awake, happy, and, and open. And the book is about practices to bring you there. You know, the idea, Jesus taught two sermons, one to the masses. 
be a good giver and you'll be a great getter. And if you are a great getter, then you can pay the Romans their taxes on time. Right? So, but then he taught the, his disciples, give without expectation. Be a servant. And they got so much paper, they had no problem with taxes. So the givers, you know, this idea of learning how to give without being small. The more you can let go of your gift, the more attractive you are. And this idea of being needy causes all suffering, sicknesses from neediness. And, and without, you know, you know, needing nothing attracts everything. So operating from a, a space, a calm space, you know, all you need in life is a comfortable seat. That's why I say meditate, a comfortable seat. Because I don't care how big your house is, you can sit your ass in only one seat at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's big. He said, "You look around, and empty seats make you sick. A lot of empty seats make you sick inside." So, holding on to stuff, give. You know, the cycle of giving. Be part of it. You know, and then you'd be a good getter because you're a great giver. That's it's important. And Super Rich is about that practice, and it's a business book, despite what Business Week said. You know, you know, it's a bestseller despite what they said too. <laughs> but but yeah, you know, I don't mean, I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> anyway, it's the business mindset that they say is business, but these are the people who work and you know, and they get rigid. You don't want your kids to be rigid either. I talk about art and creativity and all these things being an important part of a kid's education. Because you're trapped in and you're trapped. A school's like a prison if you don't have you know, uh, creativity and dreams. You can't dream. You ain't, you ain't doing nothing. So dreaming is important. The great yogi says the imagination is God. Yogananda says the imagination is God. When everything happens from the imagination first, every footstep you take, as you say, is ordered. Everything that you do, you imagine it first. I mean, to fill these holes I'm talking about, people walk around and say, "What business can I get into?" They start looking at everybody else's stuff. And they don't see it, the whole world is needy for things that you can fill the voids. They need a lot. So you need open minded people can see new space to brand into. But I tell you, there's not one black designer. That's, think about it. Shit, not one. In the men's department. And, and Macy's reached out and they said, you know, let's really amp up our partnership. But it's, there's not one, you know, it's an, it's an industry that didn't seem like it was calling you. And, and, and we talked about the integration in Hollywood and the lack of integration. There's a hole, it's money. It's money, you know, and, and what you know, your knowledge in the mainstream, you become that much more valuable. If you're an African American experience, then you have something to do with this new, new America. In fact, the jazz or blues or rock and roll or hip hop come from, you know, it's the way that it crossed though. It's how does it fit into the mainstream? And if you don't, if you lock yourself out of the mainstream, also, then you don't have a lot to say about how it it seeps into the mainstream. If you're not integrated, you can't integrate your cultural ideas. You know, you know, you run around in a purple suit with 13 buttons. It's not and gators. It's not going to get you on MTV. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is that wrong? Just what I'm saying. Right? <laughs> Of the purple suit and the, and the gators. Not at all, but I'm not not. <laughs> <laughs> Except the gators. I'm like, I'm Peter's man, you know. <laughs> Kill animals, but we can help, especially alligators. Right. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we only have two more questions, and then we're going to open up to the audience. Um, this next question is if you could give business advice to your younger self, what three things would you tell yourself to do? And what three things would you tell yourself to stay awake from? I have to say that all my experiences brought me here. I'm thankful for all of them. But I would, I would tell a young person from my experience that um, the anxiety and the, 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 the insomnia and the stuff that I thought drove me. I remember my first yoga class. I went to so many, this is 20 years ago, I went, there were so many cute girls in yoga. <laughs> like, there was no dudes, none. There was, no, there was like one gay guy, and that was it. Like, there was like, and um, I remember going there and coming out and just for a minute having a little freedom and saying, God. And I thought if I kept doing this, I would like, not, I'd lose my drive. 
that I would lose my energy, you know, to, to, to build this. But it was the opposite. I used to think that the anxiety and the insomnia and the rethinking and rethinking what I did every day in business or wherever made me. But it was the stillness where the ideas came from. The creativity came from the stillness. So you do less, but you, in terms of spinning your wheels, but you get traction. So I would tell my, I would say to do things to promote stillness, not to, not to, you know, the rush with my name is Rush. Believe me, I meditate twice a day, but my name is Rush. And my name is Rush for a reason, because I used to be like, you know, fanatic energy, a lot of it. And, you know, I think that the fanatic energy is not the driving force in your life. It's the calmness that you operate from. You know, when you're in a watcher, it doesn't mean you're not working when you're in a watcher. It means your nervous system is from the noise. So I would tell myself to not to, you know, feed into Obviously, I wouldn't have took every drug on the planet, you know, a lot, right? I wouldn't take a lot of every single drug, which I did, right? I wouldn't have done that, but, but <laughs> that didn't help calm my mind, you know? You know, <laughs> you know I, but I, I would have said the calmness is important. To, if you chase anything, chase stillness. Chase nothing. But if you must chase something, chase consciousness. Chase, chase what they call Christ consciousness. Chase what they call nirvana, samadhi, taqwa. You know, depending on your religion, it's just this union with God. Chase that first, and then everything else will come in place. And the, and the people in church would say, "Amen, amen." <laughs> um, and then this is the last question. We're going to open it up to you all. So we know that you know dreaming is a journey. So the question here is, what big dream will Russell Simmons conquer next, and how can we support you? I have a, I have a letter that Dr. Boyce Watkins and I wrote to the president, and it's not come out yet. And I'm going and I'm, I reached out to everybody from Will Smith to Richard Branson to Diddy to every rapper you can think of to Kim Kardashian. I want everybody with social media to remind the president, who I know has got a lot on his plate, he needs our support in many issues. You know, uh, from, I mean, he's not involved anymore in the gay rights issue. He's done his job. We uh, hope the Supreme Court does their job. I mean, he's not, he's got the gun rights issue in front of him, but right behind that, we got to stop locking up these people for being diseased. And, uh, and, there's a war on drugs we've got to stop. It. And so we want all the social media, we want this whole country to have a dialogue about the prison industrial complexes, choke hold on your tax dollars. And the structure of the entire black community. You know why I have jail culture in the hood? Because they locked up diseased people and taught them jail culture and sent them back hopeless and that became the culture of the hood. It became the norm, you know, and it's because of the people they locked up who were diseased. Blacks go to jail ten times more than their white counterparts for the same use of drugs. And they're ten times more likely to be convicted when arrested. Now, that's not saying, it's not a racist thing, it's just a, it's functional this way, it's the way it works. This is a fact, these are numbers. So. So not only is it terribly unjust, everybody's using drugs. Oxycontin and heroin are the same shit. People who can't afford Oxycontin move to heroin. I don't know if you know that. Right? Oxycontin is more expensive than heroin. And you, go, you don't go to jail for it. You should, so, but, the, but the people are being like 20 times or 100 times to one for putting baking soda in your Coke. 20 to, 100 times more jail time? Then a guy who had coke, as much coke as you, but you got bacon soda in your shit. So you got to go to jail for it, you know. And that's been, the prison industrial complex is, hey, you know, and, and the number one thing on top of that, and why the prison industrial complex can operate and create or support these laws that we know are unjust and, and destroyed communities, is because of the lobbying in our country. That legal bribery is the norm. Our politicians don't work for us, they work for the money. That's why I occupy, that's why I slept in the park, because our politicians are not working for us, they're working for the money. And Wall Street controls our government, not the people. So our democracy is flawed. So for me, that has been a big issue 
and, and, and today we can at least address the prison industrial complex. The letter will go out soon. You know, I, like I said, every hip hop person you can think of and every pop person from Ron Howard to Sir Richard Branson to Scott Johansson, so anybody you can think of is signing this letter. And I say anybody because they have social capital. I'm calling people with social capital. You know, I got to phone one of the biggest African American women. She said, I would call it myself. I said, we need a public discussion. And I got off, I said, that's all right, I'll call Kim Kardashian. <laughs> but she's got 20 million followers, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it's a very important issue, and it really is the reason our communities are in such bad shape because we, we lock these diseases in blood, and we're doing it for 40 years. That's right. And we worked very hard on um, changing the Rockefeller drug laws in New York State. We did a lot of work. The artists did that work. They showed up and brought 100,000 people to the governor's office, and he changed the law. And then we went back again when Governor Patterson became governor. He marched with us once, and then he changed the law again. And, you know, it was still a lobbying process to get it done. But there's been some change where judges, judges in New York State at least have some discretion. Used to be if you got coke in your pocket and you're the wrong person, you're going to jail for a very long time just by, just by having a little drug. You ain't got to be a drug addict, disease, nothing, just recreational. And you could have a very serious problem. And in some states you still do, obviously. 90% um, of people cop a plea. They go to jail for less time, but you know, a lot of time they just stuck going to jail for a very long time. And that, you know, that's where you learn to become violent and destructive, and you're let out in the hood with no chance for a job or nothing, and you become a recycled, profitable customer to the prison industrial complex. All right, so I'm sure that when this letter it goes public, it will be on Global Run, right? Well, hopefully it'll be on CNN. CNN. <laughs> it'll be on Global Run for sure. Yeah. Okay, all right. It'll be everywhere. Well, see, it'll be everywhere. So watch out for this. Um, we want it to be on the Facebook page of Lady Gaga. Really, that's right. Okay. All right, and we will stand with you in this video. And check it out. Yes, sir. Um, so now we are going to take questions. Take questions. <laughs> <laughs>